Your call has been forwarded to an automatic voice message system. My tone is not available. At the tone, please record your message. When you have finished recording, you may hang up or press 1 for more options. More and more androids show signs of deviancy. There are millions in circulation. If they become unstable, the consequences will be disastrous. My name is Kara. This is where it all began. The world's forge. And it will all end. Hi, Matt. This is your girl, Dana Gurrier, from Detroit Become Human. I hope you're doing good today. I hope the weather's not too hot as it is here in Louisiana. Uh, give me a call as soon as you can. I look forward to hearing from you. Bye. On the line, we have Dana Gouillet talking to us. From where are you talking to yes. us from, Dana? From the great state of Louisiana, just outside of New Orleans. New Orleans. That's right. New Orleans. Yeah. I do love people from New Orleans. Yes, and I go back about six or seven generations, actually. Really? Yeah, my folks have been there since nearly the beginning of the city. So, And I've got some family from France and, you know, a gener generational family from France. And Martinique is in there, uh, as well as Western African roots, as well as apparently uh, parts of the UK as well. So maybe I need to get out there and meet some family. <laughs> well, I have some news to tell everybody. Okay, what's that? My news is that I have bought a PS4. Oh, <laughs> that's a good buy right there. That's mm. a good purchase. And I'd like to say, for the record, Quantic Dream, if you're listening, it wasn't anything to do with the fact that I've been doing these interviews that made me want to buy it. <laughs> so a free copy would be much appreciated. <laughs> Oh, we'll have to make that happen. We'll see if we can make that happen for sure. Anyway, obviously, that's why we've got you here, isn't it? We've got you here to talk about Detroit Become Human. Right. I've been overwhelmed by the response that I'm getting from these interviews. Mm -hmm. It is ridiculous. As in... Yeah. I don't know if you've got Twitter, Dana. I do. I do. Uh, um, uh, it's one of my social media situations. I also have Instagram as well as Facebook. Um I think primarily I use Instagram and Twitter. That's what I'm verifying on, whatever that means in life, <laughs> in the grand scheme. Uh, but I have seen the reception. I've gotten tagged in so many things. I've gotten the most beautiful feedback about Detroit. It's been really special how people have responded to it, certainly. Mm. I mean, there's a couple of things that I've sort of noticed, just to point out. I haven't actually spoken with anybody from the cast regarding this, so this is all new stuff, Dana. Firstly, the fan art. I don't know if you've seen it. Mm -hmm. I've seen a few things, and it's pretty incredible how they've captured what they've seen from the video game. Also, I have to give a shout-out to the creators. I mean, uh, the graphics, the details, the 360-degree sort of models that they took for our avatars is really, really remarkable stuff. I haven't technically played the game yet, but I have seen images from it, and I've seen like excerpts from it, and it's just incredible it's really really special and the second thing is i don't know if you know dana but i don't usually go into people's personal lives but because it was sort of connected to the game slightly i have to obviously mention it is the fact that brian and amelia got married yeah 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 and so obviously <laughs> they've got the hashtag amelia become descartes i think it was <laughs> Right. Not only are you having the fan art from the game, you're also having the fan art right. of the wedding. I haven't seen it just yet, but I'm sure it's lovely. Yeah, it's one of those moments in gaming, especially with what Brian's doing. I mean, he's got his own Twitch channel and, and, and stuff like that. It's one of those moments mm -hmm. in gaming that makes you glad to be a gamer. And right. I say that because... I mean, there was some weird tweets going around, like, oh, you know, this wedding is bigger than Meghan and Harry. Mm -hmm. And I thought, yeah, in a gaming sort of way, it probably is. And the way, obviously, yeah. how the fans have responded with this fan art and and walkthroughs and all that stuff, it's, it's massive. Absolutely. Yeah, no, 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 it is. And what I love is that the fans will hashtag different characters. They'll hashtag Kara, they'll hashtag... Um, Jesse Williams' character, uh, and put up this really beautiful fan art 
from the game itself, which is really special. You know, I think it's a huge compliment to all of the creators of the project. Mm. Well, obviously, let's go back before the release, before any of it. Mm -hmm. What was production of the game like for you? Firstly, the audition process was unique unto itself. We shot the audition just like a film, and I was coached as if it were an audition for film or television, which was detailed and uh, really specific to the emotional life of the character. It was like, this is not your run-of-the-mill average video game. We want real emotional life. We want to see her experience these things. We want her to have like a human experience as an avatar in a video game, if you will. So the audition process alone was really extraordinary, and I felt like a better actor when I left, you know what I mean? If that makes any sense to you, I really went for it, which was fun to do, and it, it stretched me. It, it was great. And then I got the call some uh, weeks later that there was interest, and we went in and we retaped again, and I think I did a Skype call with David. I don't remember exactly, but eventually I would find out that I booked it and that it shot in Paris, which was incredible. And then, and then I started to do a little bit more research on Quantic Dream and all of the people involved. I was just blown away by their expertise, their ability to create this world and how long it takes, because this is something they've been after for years or been working at um, for years. So, yeah, that was the initial experience i arrived into paris i guess on a monday or no maybe a sunday and i got settled in and i got escorted straight away to the facilities over at quantic uh, i was shown the set if you will which was basically a stage it's like similar to a sound stage with 80 infrared cameras that picked up your every movement and then i saw the suits and man let me tell you something matt these suits are not flattering on any person but I will. I would like to say they were cute on me. <laughs> they had these reflector lights all over, and then these reflective dots, obviously, all over your face, which was interesting. It was an interesting take for me as it relates to hair and makeup, because that's essentially what that is. It's wardrobe hair and makeup. It was truly a remarkable experience. I'd never done anything like that before, anything regarding motion capture, or even thought in my wildest dreams that in my career I would have an avatar in a video game. Like, that's crazy i'm just a black woman from new orleans you know what i mean mm. so to have this experience you know what i'm saying like to be able to represent such a large number of people and a curvy black woman at that you don't always see those types of imagery or images in the video gaming world and so i was truly deeply honored to be a part of not just the gaming world as a whole but particularly this project and the fact that you can play a different game every single time uh, is really special. How difficult mm -hmm. is it to do a script like that? Because obviously, as you said, it, you know, different choices right. mean different paths. The way I approach my process is no different from the way I approach film and television. I break the script down, I dissect it, I get little sticky tabs. Um, I've worked with Quentin Tarantino twice now, and that's not to name drop. I say that with pride and confidence because I learned so much. And uh, I get really, really, really detail-oriented, which is something I learned from working with some of the cast and crew working on the projects that I did with them. And so I approached this the same way, just dissected the script, really wanted to get into understanding what Rose wants, what's going on in her head. Why does she want to help these individuals? Why does she want to help these, basically, machines? The argument is that they're not machines, you know what I mean? She goes into this really deep conversation, this very emotional conversation with her son, and she just has deep empathy for them and understanding. So I approached it the same way. I do the homework, uh, created an internal emotional life. But I have to be honest, David was uh, fantastic at spearheading and directing. Sometimes I like to work outside in as an actor and not having costuming and particularly shoes. I'm big about shoes, what kind of shoes my character wears. I like my characters to smell a certain way. I like to get real detail-oriented into building who and what this person is, creating the internal world by using external tools, if you will. I had none of that. As it relates to motion capture, you don't have access to any of those things. You have to be in this full-bodied suit with, like I mentioned, the reflectors, and you have a cap on your head. You're in these particular shoes that they want you to wear with reflectors on them. 
And so literally you are left completely and solely up to the devices of your imagination and, uh, you know, the direction you get. So I'm not going to lie to you. It was a little complicated at first to still have this vast emotional honesty and create this world and see it when there's literally a stage with tape everywhere and there's these reflectors and there's just cameras and everybody's in the same suits. It really, really, I feel, stretched me as an actor. It made me realize your imagination and your ability to find deep empathy and uh, connection with your partners. It's not about what's going on externally. It's about the connectivity between you and that individual and what's going on internally. That was really special for me to learn. And also, like, the sort of blocking of it all is different, Matt. If you're in a film or television, for example go to the table, sit down with your coffee, and say your lines. You know what I mean? That may not necessarily be exactly how you're directed, but that's essentially blocking. Move to this point, use this object, and speak the text, if you will. There's no objects. There's no desk. There's no coffee. There's no mug, rather. There's no um, you know, physical, tangible tools for you to use. I mean, there are a few. But it's basically like a true exploration and make-believe. And it is the coolest thing in the world. I would like to say that you've started me off on a theory. Okay. Yeah. I think that anybody, any atom mm-hmm. in the universe is mm-hmm. easy to explain by one. But when it's mocap, okay. it becomes zero. You're all essentially the same thing. There's nothing there. It's mm. the uh, ground floor. It's the foundation of having to create the world yourself Mm. you know what i mean like you can be clothed by a wardrobe specialist a costume designer you can have hair and makeup done by the most exceptional teams you know what i mean you can have set design out of this world and that it, it it makes our jobs so much easier to have those things and then to be stripped of them completely and you have to you know, rely on each other and rely on yourself. It was pretty, it was a little complicated, but doable, absolutely. And Mm. it was challenging in all the right ways. I found it a remarkable experience. You know, it reminds me of when, like, when I was a kid, my mom used to always say she would just peek in my room and see what I was doing. And I would have these lavish, like, big drawn-out stories that were happening. It was make-believe. I was just, you know what I mean, creating uh, stories from my own imagination. But obviously the stakes were way high. This is real subject matter, real adult subject matter as it relates to real issues that are happening right now, this very second. Replace the machines, if you will, quote-unquote, with actual human beings. This is exactly what Jewish people went through. This is exactly what slavery was. I know those are big subjects our headers to throw into this conversation, but it's all relative. It's all definitely connected in some way. Individuals, um, whether they're human or not, feeling like they're having a human experience, uh, fleeing for their life. Obviously, when I say those big headers, we're talking about the Holocaust and we're talking about mass murdering and these different things that happen actually historically to beings that are human, to human beings. But I think what the game is getting at is that these AI individuals are feeling like they're having a human experience. And essentially, there are people believing that they are. I don't know. I don't, I don't want to get too deep. I'm fearful that I'm going to say the wrong thing, so I don't want to do that either. But there is an absolute direct connection that I think the game gets at. Mm. You know? Mm. So. Going back to the mocap bit for a second. Sure. You're the first person... In 10 years, who has ever described this whole shoe thing, basically. This, this whole shoe thing <laughs> yeah. sort of thrown me off a bit because you're the first person who's ever sort of mentioned it. But you can just imagine, especially with mocap, the possibilities but also the limitations. I mean, I mean I've mean, i never suggested it, but I feel like I should do now. Can you really get into arguments if, if there's like there's two actors in the same bit and mm-hmm. then and then sort of I don't know like you said you were sitting down at a table with coffee sure there's the bloody coffee right <laughs> wait 
It's in your right hand. I thought it was in your left. Where is it? Yeah. Did you put it to this side of the table or that side? You know, yeah, no, I totally get it. They make it real simple for us, though, as it relates to, look, here's your seat. You get into the car here. This is the mock car. Here's the door. You press a button to open the door. It's going to be to your left. You know, they give us the details. Otherwise, you know, how will it all cohesively work together? And I think a big part of that is just communication. Like even as it relates to our physical life, hey, when I go in to hug you, you going right or left. And then also you don't want to make it too inorganic. You want to make it as organic as possible. But I think the name of the game there is just communication. That's direction. You know what I'm saying? Like that's the director letting us go, setting it up for us, telling us everything that is happening in the scene. You know, our emotional life is our job. But basically the blocking part of it, hey, here are all the moving parts. This is happening here. This is happening there. Then you're going to move here and then you're going to press this button, this imaginary button. And that's going to open the door and blah, blah, blah. That's just communication and I think direction mm-hmm. at the top. And then we just run it until we get it right. Mm. You know, you keep working it until it's just right. Mm. So. so on that basis then, Dana, mm-hmm. here's the question. Are there any sort of funny anecdotes you could share about the production of the game? I don't know if it's a funny anecdote, but this is something super interesting that I, I never thought it would be an issue. So when I get really involved in what I'm doing, I, I will perspire. And also, you should know, it was in the summertime in Paris. And I think for, not necessarily, maybe yet, actually, no, for sound purposes, the AC wasn't always on. So it was really hot at times. And my reflectors on my face would just start to melt off. And so in a traditional film or in television where you might have last looks or someone might touch up your makeup. My last looks were always my reflectors being replaced on my face because we'd lose them. And then what was interesting, you had to find them because the infrared, these 80 or so cameras, these infrared cameras that were set up will pick up the little reflectors that fell. So there were two people who were specifically on reflectors that fell off my face or melted off, if you will. And that picked them up off the actual set of the ground, the ground of the set, to make sure they weren't picked up by the cameras. And that was just, like, extraordinary to me in itself. Because it's like, whoa, this is crazy. That's, a, I guess, a little funny little anecdote that, that my reflectors kept melting off. But, you know, it wasn't their fault. It was mine. I was just really into the character. Hmm. It is what it is. We got it done. All the people I've spoken to about, about the game have said how, obviously, they've gone to Paris to film it film it that's not really the word but they've said how much they liked paris yeah yeah and the thing is is that i'm just wondering why quantic dream never called it paris become human and then you could have mo-capped paris maybe i don't know right yeah which would have been really amazing you know so funny i wondered for a long time as well why they named the game detroit become human but when you think about the history and culture of Detroit it does tend to make sense I mean you have everything from civil rights to just historical culture um, Motown I mean I'm just throwing subjects out there you know what I'm saying Mm -hmm. so it did uh, make sense to me it's also like a town that has experienced such financial devastation and then it's like also like come up from that financial devastation also again the Great Lakes area in general, like Michigan and those areas, it made sense because it was not too far off from the Canadian border, which I think was a very important plot point, uh, driving force to get to this particular area behind the game. Mm. Um, so it made sense uh, absolutely to me eventually. But yeah, I would love for them to do a Paris become human and Rose goes to Paris. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I would love that. Are you kidding? Did you do anything in Paris? That was my third visit. Uh, I love Paris. Uh, absolutely love Paris. I've been in different seasons as well. Been during the summer. I've been during the winter. I think I've been once in the fall as well. Mm. Uh, but this particular trip was special because it's the first time I was brought overseas for work. Actually, no, that's not true. I did a job in Puerto Rico, but it was definitely my first European job which was really special because that's always been a dream. There's nothing like, I mean, Matt, there's nothing like being brought to another country for work. It's just so special. And it made me view Paris in a whole different light. The times that I'd gone to Paris before were, it was really like sort of piecemeal together trips 
One was when I was in my 20s and I had this ticket. I didn't have a ton of money or anything like that. I had a friend of a friend who let me stay with her, my dear friend Stephanie Benet. And I was welcomed, you know what I mean? I was perfectly comfortable and I had a lovely time. But this visit, they really, really took care of us and they wanted to make sure we were comfortable and had everything we needed. I learned this as uh, a director. So I just directed my very first short film last summer. Executively produced it. I put up all the money. I did everything from scouted locations to sorted out cameras to virtually edited it. I mean, from start to finish, it was my baby. And what I learned, the extraordinary thing that I learned was that I had all these hats, right? And actors, they only have just one hat. But the thing about it is, is that they have to show up on the day. You know, a producer has 80 million things going on in their brain. A cinematographer has 80 million things going on. Uh, everything from the set design to the wardrobe to all of it as, as it relates to this particular project. Graphics, um, capturing the 360 degree imagery of our bodies. There's so many moving parts and everybody has so many things on their mind and things to do. But actors really just have one job but they have to do it. They have to show up on the day. The way we were treated upon arrival, it just makes for you wanting to do an even better job. Like, man, these people are treating us so phenomenally. So I particularly wanted to, and I always show up to do my job, but I really wanted to make sure that they were pleased with the work that I did because of how I got to see Paris. I mean, I had a day off where I just explored. I'd never been inside of Notre Dame. And I got to finally see it after three visits to Paris. I finally got in because it was closed for construction at one point. And uh, another another trip, I just missed it. I went back to the Eiffel Tower. I did all the touristy things, but also did like the sort of, you know, non-touristy things too, which is where I just went to a random restaurant with a friend. You know, I loved it. It was extraordinary. I'm trying to get my parents to come to Paris and all my girls. Funny enough, you're saying this and, and you like this so we can have a little bit of a moment here. Sure. I've just turned 30. Okay. Mm. I love that. Me and my parents went to Paris in May. Okay. And there's a few things about Paris. I've never been, never been to Paris until, until then. A few things that I'll um, mention about Paris. One is how good the metro system is. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's so cultured and historic. Like, these are the same tunnels since turn of the century, I feel like. It's got the same feeling and energy and vibe as when they were built, when they were first built. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? The second yeah. thing is, is I don't like hikes at all. So no, oh, okay. I went up the Eiffel Tower, absolutely scared out of my wits. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> did you lose it a little bit? I did lose it a little bit. And the fir- <laughs> and the third thing is, I'm the only person in the world who can safely say that they've taken a selfie with the Mona Lisa. Huh? Yeah. Send it to me. I would love to see that. I'll yeah. find one and I'll send. I definitely have a picture of the Mona Lisa, but I don't have a selfie. I would love to see it. <laughs> yeah. We'll trade some Parisian photos. Mm, I mm. can't believe your first time going was in May, and don't you live like. Isn't yeah. that a two hour train ride? It's something like that, yeah. Something like yeah. that. That's so funny. You know what, though? I can't give you a hard time about it because there are places right here in America that I haven't been to that I should have absolutely visited for example of course this is a longer distance but I haven't seen Niagara Falls yet and I'm itching to see that and there are so many other places you know in this country that I would like to see oh Grand Canyon I have not seen the Grand Canyon yet which is crazy and I suppose the other thing as well as you mentioned Notre Dame I actually went in Notre Dame as well yeah yeah and I've got footage of it I do too we'll trade that too and the, and the other interesting thing is, did you go in when they were doing, um, not confession? Mass? Yeah, mass. Yeah, I, I definitely caught um, a bit of mass. And I also, I went to Saint-Sulpice. Uh, it's in the lower bank, so I guess maybe the west bank. Mm. It's definitely across the Seine, in the lower part of the city, the south, southern part of the city, rather. It's this magnificent older church. Uh, and I did experience confession there, which was an interesting thing because I don't speak French. Mm. I was just speaking in English and the priest was just speaking in French and it was still a very communal experience because despite the fact that we were speaking different languages, 
I, I understood him perfectly and he understood me perfectly. Mm-hmm. So on a human level, we understood each other, which was really cool. That was a very cool experience. Man, Matt, I haven't thought about that or even spoken about it in literally years. There you go. I'm yeah, here. Yeah, there you go. There you um, go. <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, Dana, I'm, I'm just going to put it to Quantic Dream because you're probably going to be the last person I speak to regarding the game. I want to thank them for their support, basically. Yeah, um, they're wonderful people. The other thing as well is, if you want to do another game in the in the franchise, if you're doing a mm-hmm. franchise, you could do it in a completely different way. I don't know, Paris become detective or something like. I don't know. <laughs> Basically, it's a bit like the Da Vinci Code, but you go around different museums and make choices about whether you destroy the Mona oh my Lisa God, or how cool would that yeah, be? yeah, and we'll bring Brian back. Brian can do some of it. I don't know what for sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that would be really cool. Maybe we'll throw in a little romance and stuff. That would yeah. be dope. That would be really cool. Or even better, you can make Brian sort of a bit like Ethan Ethan Hunt from Mission Impossible. I don't know. Oh yeah, that would be really mm. cool. That would be really cool. That would be fun. I love spy movies and all that type stuff and historical culture oriented subject matter and we've got to find the key. Where's the key? You know what I mean? Little things like that. That would be fun. Details like that, rather. Let's talk a bit about you, Dana. You yourself. Oh, sure. Yeah. What made you want to get into acting in the first place? Well, um, I was about 12 years old, actually 11, and it was the summertime in New Orleans and my mom had gotten wind of a program me and my younger brother ended up, we went through the whole process. Like I had my very first audition, I was 11 years old. We went through the process of auditioning, being cast and, you know, going through rehearsal process and dress rehearsals. And we put on a show and we had an opening night and a closing. And after that summer, it just never got away from me. I tried to do different things. Like I tried to major in psychology for a brief time. Um, I tried to explore different avenues, but my heart always belonged to that particular art form, which is acting and performance specifically. So much so that both of my degrees, my BFA and my MFA, are both in performance. There's a five-year length of time that I was living in New York in there and uh, went to grad school uh, at CalArts, California Institute of the Arts. To get back to your specific question, it, it was just, you know, an experience as a kid, being in front of an audience and experiencing live theater, and there's literally nothing like it. You feel so alive in those types of environments and situations, and also when you're a part of something and a part of a group of people where you feel like you belong to them and you finally found like sort of your people, if you will. And nobody had the same color. Everybody was different. Um, it was a very diverse group of kids, but they felt like my people. As a kid, I never felt like I belonged with a certain group. I was always a little bit odd and different, sometimes shy into myself, sometimes boisterous and outgoing. But when I found the theater, it's like I found home, so to speak. You know, and then that just translated into film and television. I always tell people, outside of my family and my friends, there's nowhere else I'd rather be than on a set. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, obviously, your name dropped earlier. I've got to mention that again. Your name dropped. <laughs> I didn't mean to. I really yeah. was just trying to make a point. I didn't mean a name drop. No, no, it's all right, because I was going to talk about it anyway. Um, sure. was the fact you were in two Quentin Tarantino films. <laughs> what was it like working on both films, and why do you think that Quentin Tarantino is one of the best directors of them all? Oh. Um. I'll do the second first. He's one of the best, no matter if you like his work or not, or if you're into his, you know, version of art or not. I personally feel he is one of the best because of how much he loves it and how equipped he is as it relates to his knowledge of film, specifically. That man is a walking database and slash encyclopedias. Like, he is just so versed in film and filmmaking and particularly specific genres of film. When we were shooting Django Unchained, Saturdays and Sundays were our off days. But every Sunday, he screened two films for us. And he would present the films to us and uh, basically do a little informational, like, few minutes on the director, the DP, the actors, you know, the actual film production. And it was basically like having film classes on Sundays while you're shooting a film with you know, 
at least one of the most versatile directors that will go down in history. Like I said, you know, he's an acquired taste. Some people love him. Some people aren't really into him. But make no mistake, he's absolutely pivotal and has shifted the paradigm as it relates to filmmaking. And he did so very early on in his career. So that's why I think he's one of the best. Django was so special. It was special because I was very green. I was just out of grad school. And it was the first, like, big budgeted film I'd ever done in my career. I had done a couple of television shows before, but this was my first film, like my first big movie. And I felt so afraid, equal parts afraid, equal parts excited, equal parts like elated to just be there. And I learned so very much. Uh, I picked up things from being on Django Unchained that I will carry for the rest of my career. Things I'll never let go of. Things that have absolutely nothing to do with character development and everything to do with character development. Like I'll never forget Sam Jackson, who is still my mentor and friend. He had me sign the top of his script. He didn't ask me to sign it. His, uh, uh, his, uh, the guy that works with him, uh, our dear friend Volney, had me sign it. But I remember Sam asking me later if I signed it. And I was so flattered by that because Sam wanted me to sign his his script. And he was like, yeah, you got it. And he told me, he's like, you got to get everybody to sign the you know, front page of your script. That's special. And I've done that ever since, like on any production where I've built a family with these people. And we've been together for an extended period of time. I get them to sign the front cover of my script. And I did it on Hateful as well. So I've got, you know, one with Clinton and Sam and, you know, Jamie Foxx. And, and then I have another one with like, you know, Kurt Russell and the list goes on. Like, it's just really special. It's uh, ex- extraordinary experiences that I've had on these sets and working with such like out of this world actors and performers, Leonardo DiCaprio, Carrie Washington, you know what I mean? To name a few, just really extraordinary people that I learned from Christoph Waltz. I mean, Christoph Waltz, I could just watch him all day long. And he was so sweet to me. Hateful was a much different experience. You know, hatefully, the months leading up, uh, my father was diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer, and he has since beat it. But that was really tumultuous to experience right before having to go up on this mountain to shoot this film. My priorities were so different. So when I see hatefully, I remember that time. I remember thinking, how am I going to do this? My heart is at home. But my mind and my body is here and I'm so focused on his work because Quentin, he has high expectations of his actors and you will deliver. You absolutely will deliver. One way or another, he's going to get what he needs from you. So it's like all of these things. I really feel like I graduated during that time because to be on the set of one of like the greatest directors, but to also like have these other personal things going on was pretty... uh, out of this world and out of body to experience. I also learned, though, through all of that, that I could do anything. Like, if I can kind of show up on the day with all those things going on, then I could do anything. I felt invincible after finishing Hateful Eight. Because it wasn't just, like, what was personally going on. It was the altitude. I got severe altitude sickness. I got a horrible sinus infection that knocked me down for the entire week before shooting. Being on the mountain, there is no air in your body, it feels like sometimes. The cold environment, just the conditions and uh, that part of it. And still, Matt, it was still fun. It was still extraordinary. We still had a blast. We still did our thing that Quentin does on his sets, which are a bunch of fun little anecdote things that, you know, only people who are on his sets know about. We still just knocked it out of the park. I still showed up. It was still one of the most exceptional experiences of my life. And I just feel like it's a testament to life. You know, the pendulum will swing. It'll swing left and it always comes back. It'll swing right as well. So whatever craziness you experience in your life, there's going to be this upswing of extraordinary experiences. And that's what Hateful Eight was like for me because it was like a real shot. You know, he wrote the part for me. Minnie was truly highlighted. Uh, she was really like this figure in the in the in the film and an integral part of the plot. Like I had a real chance to shine, and 
I'm just really proud of the work that it did, and I'm proud to have been a part of the project, and I'm proud that I showed up and got her done. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm going to give you a one-minute plug. Uh, to plug, okay. obviously, Detroit Become Human. Whenever you're ready, Dana. If you get the chance, please go out and get Detroit Become Human. It is an extraordinary game. I think it's one that will make you think as an individual, as a human. Play it. Play it again. You know, have your experience. Have another experience. Pick different characters. But definitely, please try the experience of Detroit Become Human. So Dana, it's come to that point in the podcast where I have to go, what the hell were they thinking? Uh (laughs) Because in September 2018, there's a reboot of Cagney and Lacey. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Why? Why reboot? Why? You know, Time Daily... It's so extraordinary. And, you know, I can't talk bad about him because we had Rosemary Rodriguez at the helm. It was brilliantly written and created in its own right. We had female department heads. It was a really female forward project. You got two female detective leads. Like, I could see how the thought that this could be great would cross folks' minds. You're right. At the end of the day, it's Cagney and Lacey, and Cagney and Lacey was iconic. I'm not going to lie to you, though. I was kind of crushed. We didn't get greenlit by CBS, which was so hurtful because what folks will never know is that the team itself was really special, fantastic. It was such easy camaraderie and easy connection and, you know, great chemistry, great chemistry amongst the set amongst the uh, cast and then the crew was fantastic as well everybody was just so chill and there was no real like no bad energy no bad vibes from anyone really 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 cool people so you know you could tell even when we shot the pilot this would have been like a very smoothly run chill cast and crew go to work show up do your job go home Mm. So that part of it was crushing because, like, man, it was such a great group of people. I'm not a fan of reboots in the slightest. I really think you should just leave it as it is. I mean, if you want to do reboots, fine, you know, go ahead. But they could have called it Los Angeles Become (laughs) Lacey or something like that. I think they did have another one uh, of a similar mind where they had these three female lead detectives. I'm not sure that it went either. I don't think it went either. <laughs> so, I'm not sure. Do you know what? Just by doing this interview, Dana, they may change their minds. You know, perhaps yeah. they will. Maybe I did it. Maybe I was the deciding factor. <laughs> They're not going to change their mind. But you know what? That's okay because onwards and upwards and there will be other things on the horizon. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, Mm -hmm. Dana, it's been a pleasure interviewing you. You too. It's been so great to chat with you. Before we get off, I just have to tell you, it has been one of my dreams to get to the UK. I am a crazy time, like, particularly UK historical buff. Like, I love history of the royals and any period piece that has ever come out of the uk i'm really really like crazy about england and i um i gotta get there that's just all i want to say about that i have a dear friend in sheffield who i have to go see i don't mean to be corny about it but i am so crazy into your culture and the history of your country and i just i gotta get there well we dug up um somebody in a car park they found Richard the Third in the car park. It was um No you didn't. Are you serious? Yeah. Oh my gosh. I didn't know that. You'll like this, Dana. You'll like this. Because you laughed at the last bit, you'll like like this bit a bit more. So basically they always believed that Richard the Third was killed at the Battle of Bosworth. So they started digging up Battle of Bosworth, obviously, and they found zip, yeah. basically. They found a few coins, I think, and a couple of pots or something like that. And then cool the scope changed to this car park. I don't know why it was specifically the car park that people found sort of interesting. <laughs> For years, there was an R that was painted on on the gravel of this car park. 
Okay. There was this R, just basically this letter R. Just a letter R. On the floor in, in this car. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> that's correct. And I, please don't tell me people think that's a coincidence. It wasn't our university that did it, it was the other one. The university of Leicester sent out a, um, a woman archaeologist and said, we found bones. And then they said, but the bones are curved as well. And they were like, no, you know. No, because <laughs> he had the thing with his back. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my god. And then, and then obviously I they mean... did this big BBC news conference and she stood up and walked over and they said, sure. we're, we're pretty certain. Crazy in a car park. In a car park. And then, and then the funnier thing was the fact that they then said, OK, so we've got the bones now. So what do we do with it? And they did this whole yeah. this massive, huge funeral for a king. Whoa, oh, yeah. wow, okay. And they buried him. Also, all of the historical ramifications that are associated with Richard III, like, mm. it's just the boys in the tower, like, I'm not going to get into all the things, mm. but, like, oh, my gosh. Oh, and I want to ask you a question, and I'm mm. just going to lean on my own common sense here. When you say a car park, it's just a parking lot, right? Pretty much, yeah. I love all of this. Like, you have no idea how you've made my day. Oh, good. I just, I am so itching to get to... England and I don't just want to like go to London or go to see my friend in Sheffield which I can't wait for I want to go see where Downton Abbey was shot I want to go to Bath I want to go do all things Jane Austen I want to do everything possible in and around London I want to go to Westminster I want to do it all and I'm just waiting for the right time the real dream that is to have work bring me there I want to work with Ama Santa who directed Bell which was just, like, the dream role for me. When I saw that they did Belle, when uh, Gugu Mbathara uh, played Belle, Dido Belle. Are you familiar with the film? No. She is a young woman of color whose uncle is an aristocrat, and her dad was this naval commander. Her dad is a white man, and her mother was a black woman. And the mother died. The naval commander went off to war and did his thing, and he says, but you will honor my child, and you will acknowledge her. But she was a woman of color. And she had half cousins that were like these aristocrat people. I'm doing a very bang up job of telling you the quick history of it. But needless to say, forever I was looking for a woman of color, any woman of color in the UK or historical England, like any historical woman of color figure. And Dido was on our radar. And then Ama Asanta, this brilliant, brilliant, beautiful black woman director, I mention those things because it's a rarity, I think, generally, but she's English from what I understand. And uh, I dream about working with her. I dream about doing stories like that. And then I did a little digging. Sometimes when I can't sleep at night or when I'm just trying to fall asleep, I'll just read English history. I'll just get into the royals and the lineage and whose cousins, aunts, princess is this and that. And it's not just royalty, just like just generally I'll read about English history. Because I have a real fascination for it. Maybe I was there in another life. I don't know. But in my sort of like digging, I found out about, I could be wrong, but to my understanding, uh, Queen Charlotte Sophia, uh, I believe she is the wife of Mad King George III, if I'm not mistaken. I could be getting my histories messed up, but she basically was the queen of one of the Mad Kings, Mad King George. And she had like 15 children or something crazy like that. But rumor has it, history has it, so to speak, potentially history has it, that she was a woman of color. She had Moorish blood and uh, she had features and she was the queen of England at one point. And so I would love to explore this idea of being a woman of color in this sort of like, you know, positioning. Because like as a kid, like I don't think, especially as an American as a black kid growing up, like, there's there's no idea, like, that's fantastical, the idea that she would be a part of a royal family. Of course, we have our African roots and our African royalty and kings and queens that once were. And there's also, like, you know, you have Eastern African royalty as well. But, like, the concept of European royalty, if there are actual, like, people of color that are part of that realm, has always fascinated me. And it's always something I've been fascinated by and just interested in and just, like, just really loved. Dana, I will say one thing. To anybody out there, obviously, who wants to try and see if they can get Dana onto onto an English production, <laughs> do it before Brexit. <laughs> do it before... Wait, do it before what? 
Brexit. <laughs> what is that? Brexit. Brexit? What is Brexit? Bre Brexit? You don't know what Brexit is? Oh, what is Brexit? I don't know what Brexit is. Brexit is when Britain is going to remove itself from the EU. Oh, no, I do know what this is. Mm. Of course I know. And I've been, like, really, like, kind of just like, what? Yeah. What's going on? Yeah. The funny thing is, you had the same reaction about Brexit as we had the same reaction about when you lot voted Trump in. I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> I'm very sensitive about that subject matter. I'm still mad. You know, it's so funny. I'd lean so far away from politics and religion. And in this conversation, we've already discussed Catholic churches mm. and <laughs> the nature of our uh, political state's current affairs. So, Matt, you were an excellent interviewer. This was a very fun conversation, and I can't tell you how grateful I am to have been able to uh, spend a little time with you. Oh, that's nice of you to say, Dana. Of course, mm. I mean it. Well, thanks very much for your time. Yeah, and look, stay in touch. Yes, yeah, so and now I have to send you myself here. If... In front of the Mona Lisa. Yeah, this video it. as well. <laughs> yeah, send it. Send it. Well, thanks very much for your time, Dana. All right, take care. Bye bye now. Bye bye.